I'll be reading this evening from the Old Testament, Isaiah 35, and then again this evening, we began this morning, Philippians chapter 4, we'll be looking again at verses 4 through 7, particularly this evening we'll be looking at verses 6 and 7 of that passage. So let's hear now God's word from Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice in the blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go upon it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Turn now to... Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Please be seated as we pray. O oh, gracious God and Father, in a world such as the world in which we live, particularly as we think of the great events of the last several months, events which have left us in awe, events which have helped us to see that we are very small in the grand scheme of things, but events which have also, if we have seen them through the right and proper lens, the lens of your word, events which have reminded us that you are very great, that you are a glorious God, that you are the one who is reigning over everything that happens, from the very least events, the events that happen at the very atomic level, to the great events happening throughout the galaxies as those things which you have made, the stars and the planets, move about in their orbits, and everything in between. You are the God of all these things. 
And so, Lord, as we consider who you are, help us to have calm and quiet hearts before you. Help us to be anxious for nothing by your power, for it's only by your power that this is even possible. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we began considering the theme of Christian gratitude. Our focus earlier today was on verses 4 and 5 and the command, the exhortation, which I also tried to help you to see was, is also an encouragement. It's a great encouragement to rejoice in the Lord always. We saw how this command to rejoice is actually far more than a command. Joy is the distinctive mark of the mature Christian life, the healthy Christian life. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit at work in us. It's not primarily an emotion. It's not a human response to the things that happen. Rather, joy is a Spirit-formed disposition of the believing heart. Joy is a Spirit-formed disposition of the believing heart. It's a settled contentment in Christ, a supernatural and settled contentment in Christ and in His plan for our lives. He does have a plan for our lives. It's a settled contentment in Him as the author of that plan. It's the life of Christ at work in us and flowing out of us. That's why the command to rejoice is not a burdensome duty. It's not a, a chore, a task to be performed, a box to be checked. The believing heart doesn't come to any of the commands of God in that way. The believing heart rejoices in Christ, rejoices by Christ, rejoices through Christ. The, re the believing heart rejoices to hear the voice of Christ, particularly in the preaching of the Word, when that Word is preached faithfully according to Christ's own voice. The, the, the believing heart rejoices to hear that voice, and the believing heart leaps in response to that voice and longs to follow that voice. But we also know ourselves well enough to know that we do not leap and long as we should. Often our hearts are hindered and we do not leap, we do not long as we would want to. But God has not left us to ourselves. Praise be to God. He has not left us to ourselves to <coughs> flail around in our own strength. He's given us the resources that you and I need to live joyful, thankful lives. I almost said carefree lives. If you, if you really understand the meaning of the term, to be free from care, carefree lives. That's what we want to see tonight here in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul, back, uh, Paul in verse 11, I should say, says that he has learned in whatever state that he is, he has learned to be content in all circumstances. He's learned to be content. He's learned to be content because he's learned to be thankful. He's learned to rejoice. Paul has learned to be content not just in some circumstances, but in all circumstances. And this contentment, this settled contentment, is not just for the super Christian. It's not just for apostles, you might say. Paul himself would not want us to think of him as some sort of super Christian. He was just a man. He was a, a redeemed man, just like 
you and I are redeemed men and redeemed women. And so he wouldn't want us to think of him as a super Christian who, who had it all together. But he had learned through the things that he had suffered, he had learned to be content in all circumstances. Remember, he's writing this letter from a prison cell. He's learned how to rejoice. He's learned how to give thanks at all times. He's learned how to rejoice and to give thanks even when things are not going well, even when things are not going according to his plan. He's learned, to put it simply, how to live his life in union with Jesus Christ. There's much that you and I can learn from Paul here tonight about Christian gratitude, about Christian thankfulness. Paul gives us three main things to learn. First, what is the main hindrance to Christian gratitude? Well, he tells us the main hindrance is anxiety. Secondly, the most basic expression of Christian gratitude. What is it? Well, he tells us prayer. And then thirdly, What is the spiritual fruit of Christian gratitude? Well, it's the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So we're going to look at those three things this evening as we seek to learn more how to rejoice and how to give thanks in all circumstances, to be content and to live in the light of the love of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, first of all, we want to look at anxiety, the main hindrance to gratitude. The command here is be anxious for nothing. Another command, another imperative. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in all, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, let your petitions, let your prayers be made known to God. This is the third in a series of humanly impossible commands. What do I mean? Commands that we have no natural ability to keep in ourselves. We hear these commands and we immediately, if we understand things as we ought to understand them, we immediately feel the weight of our helplessness and our inability. It's that very helplessness that our Savior speaks of in John 15 when He says, I am the vine. I am the one who has life in Himself. I am the vine, you are the branches, and apart from me, you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Apart from the powerful work of the grace of God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as it is applied to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are helpless to obey, helpless to do the will of God. But we saw this morning, and I hope that it was an encouragement to you, we saw this morning that the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. The Lord is present. The Lord is, we might say, at my right hand. He is with me. If we really understood it, it's one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible, verse 5. That the Lord is near to us by His Word and by His Spirit. We don't need to seek for anything more than that. Word and Spirit. That's why this church seeks to be a word and spirit church. Word and spirit, or the means of grace. Sometimes we call them the ordinary means of grace, but it's these ordinary means of grace through which God exercises His extraordinary and supernatural power through the simple, foolish means of preaching of all things that a people would gather together every Sunday. Instead of gathering together to watch a football game, they would gather together to hear the Word exegeted and unfolded. Only God can do that. Only God can bring people together to hear a man incapable in himself with very little rhetorical skill 
opening up the Word of God, speaking the truth of the Bible. He promises to be with us and to dwell in us by His Word and Spirit. He promises never to leave us, never to forsake us. And the Lord is also at hand in another sense. He's very near to us, particularly when we gather together in His worship. But He's very near to us also in the sense that He is coming again. And so often when in the New Testament you read of the coming of the Lord, there's a Greek word, perusia, and the word means the presence of the Lord. He is near to, the, to us in the sense that He is coming and He is coming quickly. He is coming soon. And when He comes, He will be present and visible in power and glory. And the kingdom will come and every eye shall see who He is. As His people, we are the only people in the world, on the face of the earth, who live in this constant awareness of the nearness and the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in constant anticipation of His glorious return, don't we? Shouldn't we? We should. That's what it means to be a Christian. And so what does any of this have to do with anxiety? Well, once we understand what anxiety is, we're going to see how much it has to do with anxiety. What is ang anxiety? The word means to have a divided mind. A divided mind. It's the same word that Jesus uses of Martha in Luke chapter 10. Martha, Martha, you're worried. You're troubled about many things. Your mind is divided, Martha. Your mind is distracted. You're fretful. Your mind is troubling you. It's causing you to worry. Don't be fretful. Don't worry. Don't have a divided mind. I'm here. I'm present. Hear what I have to say. The word anxiety also has to do with care and concern. Jesus uses the word that way in Matthew chapter 6. But he says, don't worry, don't be anxious about your life. Don't worry, don't be anxious about your clothing. Don't worry or be anxious about what you will eat and about what you will drink. These things, the Gentiles, the nations, the world worries about these things. Why should the people of God worry about such things, Jesus says? Don't you know who your father is? Don't you know what he's done for his people in every age of history? In every circumstance that they've found themselves in. This is the God who, who led His people Israel through the Red Sea, walls of water on both sides and dry land under their feet. That's the God who provides for His people water from the rock and manna from heaven. Why is all this important? Why do we need to avoid anxiety? Well, Jesus gives us three reasons in Matthew chapter 6. First of all, He says, we have a Father who knows our needs and who is determined to provide our needs for us. And so we have all of the promises of God in His Word. We're not like, secondly, the unbelieving world who, who live for the things of this world. We're a heavenly people. And we could have, as I said this morning, nothing at all in this world. Nothing in the stalls, as it were. No animals in the stalls. Nothing on the vine. No money in our bank account. We could be living under a bridge somewhere. But if we have Christ, we have all that we need. Everything that we need. Thirdly, he says... We're seeking a better kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And if we have Christ, we have His righteousness. If we have Christ and if we have His righteousness, then we can be content. Paul even says with food and clothing, 
we can be content. Even if we have the most basic necessities of life in this world, we should be able, as the people of God, to be content. It becomes hard when we begin to worry about the things of this world, as if the things of this world are our hope, as if the things of this world are things that will bring us ultimate happiness and joy. Worrying about tomorrow won't change what tomorrow will bring. God has decreed all things. Your worrying about tomorrow can't change a single iota of the decree of God. And God hasn't decreed the things that He's decreed because He doesn't love you, if I can use a double negative. God has decreed the things that He has decreed because He is determined to bring you into His glorious kingdom to give you a new and glorious body in which to live with Him forever. If you have that hope, then you have everything that you need. Worrying about tomorrow won't change what tomorrow will bring. God alone knows and God alone controls what tomorrow will bring. And so anxiety is really the main hindrance to Christian joy. Apart from joy, it is impossible to live a life of gratitude and hope. How much time do you and I spend distracted, worried, fretful, divided minds about the things of this life? And how much of that time? Be honest. You don't have to tell anyone else. You don't have to tell a single soul. But be honest with yourself. How much of that time that you spent worried about the things of this life and of this world, how much of that time do you think was time well spent? How much has brought you closer to Christ? How much of that has, has grown you in faith and hope and Christian love? And how much joy has it produced in your heart? I'm urging you to listen to the voice of Christ tonight. And what He's saying is something that I would never be able to conjure up or say because I know how anxious my own heart is. But he's saying, be anxious, dear, beloved child of God. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't be anxious. And I know, and he knows, that you can't just flip the switch and the anxiety is off. It doesn't work that way, does it? You can't just flip a switch because it's not you. He has to work in your heart to take away that anxiety. But what does he say? Again, listen to the voice of Christ tonight when he says, cast your cares on me. Why? For I care for you. First Peter 5. That brings us to prayer, the heartfelt expression of gratitude. Prayer is the means by which we cast our cares on Christ. Look at me at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Now there are some subtleties in the words that are used here and I'm not going to get into that tonight about the, the different words that are used here, prayer and supplication and how those words ought to be understood, your requests, your petitions, your prayers. There are some subtleties here. There are some different words that are, that are used here. But I'm going to speak in generalities tonight. I'm going to speak about prayer in general terms. Prayer is the means by which we cast our cares on Christ. And that's really the connection that we need to see at this point. Why does Paul move seamlessly from anxiety to prayer. Paul uses a, a precious word here. He uses that little word, but. It's a, it's a joining word. It's a word that you find at some very 
significant places in Scripture. I think of Ephesians chapter 2. But God, but God who is rich in mercy. We were dead in our sins and, and trespasses. We, there was no life in us at all but God. And in, in that one little word, but, you, you see the, the hinge on which everything turns. Well, here you see that again, that little word, but. It's a joining word, and, and it joins the thoughts of God together. Do you know what God is joining together here for us, what thoughts He's joining together for us? He's, he's joining all of your anxieties and cares and doubts and fears to His own gracious heart in His Son, Jesus Christ. He's joining what comes naturally to you and to me, anxiety, with His omnipotence and His grace. He's joining what we are and what we do by nature to His own gracious provision at the cross. He's joining the fullness of His deity with the weakness of our humanity. He does that in the person of Jesus. God is giving you tonight a spiritual weapon to fight against anxiety. A spiritual weapon of infinite power. More powerful than the entire arsenal of nuclear weapons on the planet. He's giving you a spiritual weapon of infinite power. It's God's own weapon, but He gives it to you by His grace. God is the one who, who gives us what we need to battle, to fight against anxiety and fear. And He gives you all that you need. He gives you the whole armor of God. Think of Ephesians chapter 6. What does He say there? He says, stand strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not in your own strength. You will fall if you seek to stand in the power of your own might. You stand in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you can resist all the lying words of the devil. The lying words of the devil surround us. As you walk out of this room, the lying words of the devil are going to assault you from every side, from every internet website that you go to, from everything that you listen to, from every voice that you hear, there's, the lying words of the devil are going to be assaulting you daily. You need to stand in the power of His might and put on the whole armor of God so that you can fight back against the lying words of the devil with the trustworthy word, of God, so that you can stand against His accusations, so that you can resist His fiery darts of temptation. What does He say? He's saying, stand in the power of your union with Christ, which is an unbreakable union. Stand by faith in the power of God's all-powerful grace. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then, Ephesians chapter 6 again, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. Notice this, for all the saints. For all the saints. We never pray just as isolated, atomized individuals. We pray as members of the body of Christ. We're joined together in the body of Christ. We are not by ourselves. We have Christ. And having Christ, we also have one another. Because we're joined with one another in Christ by the Spirit. And so we pray. We take our cares to the Lord, our cares about ourselves, our cares about our families, our cares about our children, our cares about our fellow saints in the body of Christ, our cares about what's happening in the world around us. We take everything to the Lord in prayer. 
Prayer is a God-given means of displacing anxiety with faith. It's a God-given means of displacing anxiety with faith. Notice the sheer scope of what God is giving us here. Look again at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. How much anxiety is ruled out, is cast out by the word nothing? How much anxiety is ruled out by the word nothing? And how, how much encouragement is there for you in the word everything in this verse? There is nothing, no thing too big for God to handle. Nothing too big in the great events of history, nothing too big in your life and in the lives of your family members. But why don't we think that way when we're anxious? It's so hard for us to think that way when we're anxious. What's the response of the believing heart to anxiety? See, this is the gift that God is giving to us. The response of the believing heart to anxiety is prayer. And so when we're anxious... Our temptation is just to wallow in that anxiety. God is saying, don't do that. Bring your cares to me. I can handle every one. My shoulders, as it were, are big enough. Husbands, don't cast your cares on your wives. As if... Her shoulders are the shoulders that need to bear those cares. You go first to your Father in heaven. And then, after you've been in the throne room of grace, then you can speak about the things that are on your heart. But don't weigh your wives down with your cares. Go to God first and let Him remove those cares from your shoulders before you put those cares on the shoulders of your wives. The same is true of mothers and children. What's the response of the believing heart to anxiety? The, the response of the believing heart to anxiety is prayer. Robert Canlish says this, Carry everything, literally everything that befalls you or seems likely to befall you, every choice you have to make, whatever you have to say or do, every care, every duty, every trial, every glad relief, carry everything to God. Converse with God about it. Turn it over as between God and you in every possible way. Look at it from every possible point of view. Do not be in haste to make up your mind as to what is best, as to what you should definitely ask. The very suspending of your judgment, and he means in prayer, as the consultation goes on, may make the interview more blessed. Carry everything to God in prayer. And finally, we come to the God-given fruit of gratitude, which is peace. There's a promise here in verse 7 of all surpassing peace. Look with me there. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you know what the Spirit is teaching us here in this precious verse, in these precious verses? He's teaching us that the nearness of God is enough. I said it this morning, but it bears much repetition. The nearness of God is enough. He himself is enough. His presence is all that we need. That's right where we're most vulnerable, isn't it? We think that we need so much to be happy, don't we? We think that we need to, to have so much in order to be content. I will be content when... 
I will be content if. I will be happy when. I will be joyful if. We think that we need so much to be happy and to be content. But what happens when it's all taken away? What happens when it's gone? What happens when all of the things that we have placed our hopes in in this world, all the things that we thought that we needed in order to be happy and to be content, what happens when they're removed? How will we be content? Only if we've learned to be content in Christ. You see, the answer here is that God Himself is enough. God's presence is enough. In verse 7, there's another little word here, but it's a little word that is full, that is pregnant with hope. It's the word and. It's another connecting word. This, This little word and is really the hinge of the whole passage. It connects our anxious and weak and helpless prayers because our prayers are helpless in and of themselves with the fatherly heart of God toward us in Jesus Christ. It connects our weak and helpless prayers with the promises of of God. And and that little word, and, you might say that it contains 10,000 sermons. There's so much there. It brings us into the very throne room and the temple of God. It points us to our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ who is at God's right hand. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said to Peter? Satan has desired to sift you, Peter, as wheat. But I, Jesus, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And you see, that's what you have in the very presence of God, in the the throne room of God, you have a mediator, the great intercessor, the great high priest, the Lord Jesus, who prays for you that your faith fail not. When a weak and anxious Christian with a weak and trembling faith takes hold of a strong and faithful Savior, a risen, ascended, reigning, returning Savior, of a Savior who has become our peace with God at the cross, there's an infallible promise for the believing child of God. See, the word and shows us the result of taking our anxieties to God in prayer. And it's a wonderful result. It's the promise of a peace which surpasses all human understanding. The peace of God, which is God's peace. In Hebrew, the word would be shalom, a word that in the Old Testament, if you you summarized what that word shalom in the Old Testament meant, it meant a life in communion with God. God is the source of this peace. God is its author. God is its originator. It's a a peace already proclaimed back in the second verse of the book of Philippians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A peace inseparably rooted in God's saving grace in His Son. A peace that surpasses all understanding. That doesn't just mean that the peace of God is incomprehensible to us. It is. But it means so much more than that. Literally, in the Greek, what it means is this peace is above mind. Far transcendently above our minds. God's peace does what nothing in this world can do. It's a peace that transcends infinitely all human means and methods. You're not going to get this peace from worldly psychology. When God comes with His peace, He comes to guard our hearts and our minds. He comes to surround us with His heart 
fortifying presence to surround our minds like the mountains around Jerusalem, to calm our thoughts, to dispel our anxieties, to banish our fears, and to give us Himself so that we might have peace. His peace in the midst of our circumstances, whatever they are, His peace to lift us up above those circumstances and to fix our hearts and our minds on Christ, our all-surpassing Savior, who's purchased for us an all-surpassing peace by the reconciliation that He's made at the cross. And so God promises His peace to those who cast all their cares on Him in earnest, fervent, thankful, Spirit-worked prayer. Are you anxious this evening? Do you lack peace? There's a great encouragement here for you in the Word of God. An encouragement to cast all your anxieties on the Lord, in the Lord's way, through prayer and to rest in His all-surpassing mind and heart-fortifying peace. The world around us does not know this peace, cannot know this peace, will not find this peace if it looks for this peace in the wrong places. It's a peace that cannot be found in the things that the world is seeking. It's a peace that is found only by those who are living in joyful, thankful union with Jesus Christ by faith. So when your heart is troubled, what do you do? Where do you turn? To what do you turn? To whom do you turn? Remember the words of your Savior, Jesus Christ. John 14 and 16. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God and Father, we pray that you would dispel our anxieties, that you would take them away like you have taken our sins away as far as the east is from the west. Father, we are so weak and so prone to fear and to, and to fretfulness and to care about the things of this life and the things of our bodies. We are indeed body and soul, Lord. And so we can't get away from the reality that we live our lives in this world as dust. But we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember that we are, by your grace, heavenly dust, that our home is in heaven, and that you have secured for us in Christ a heavenly peace. Please forgive us for not trusting in you as we should. And Lord, help us by your grace to turn to you in believing, heartfelt, fervent prayer. We ask all this in Jesus' name.